first event in that country. So, uh, uh, yeah, so it was the first event in the country. Sorry. Uh, yeah, it was the first event in the country. And as you see, the last uh, event was there from Ghana, Accra. So I will just try to, um, yeah, I'll just try to see how I can show you a small video about Impact Summit. So I hope that you will be able to see it and hear it. Yes, so it should be fully visible. Yes, so as you could see, uh, this was a video which we basically, uh, this was a video which we launched in the beginning of this year. Uh, unfortunately, we, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna do this. Unfortunately, some of the goals have been a little bit um, interrupted by the COVID-19, but of course we will try our best to manage it as as best as possible so now actually to my workshop so my workshop is all about opportunities and equality and opportunity so firstly i would like to highlight some details which are very important and which basically underline the fact that we are not equal we are all not equal despite the fact that we might reach uh, equality, for example, gender equality. Uh, there's always gonna be some different kind of equality which we are not gonna achieve. So as you can see, the inequality in developing countries has shot up by 11% between 1990 and 2010. 
That means that despite the fact that we have all these sustainable development goals and the United Nations is really trying to uh, basically decrease the inequality in various countries, uh, the inequality in less economically developed countries is actually increasing. And unfortunately, the point of focus in the last couple of years has not been how we can decrease inequality in LEDC countries, but the question is how we can slow down the increasing trend of inequality as much as possible. The second point which I would like to tell you is a case study of South Africa. So South Africa is basically a country which, was, which has one of the highest rates of inequality in societies. The poorest 20% of South African populations consumes less than 3% of total expenditure, while the wealthiest 20% consume 65% of the complete expenditure. Uh, this point basically shows us the, that the gap between the poorest part of our population and the wealthiest is really gigantic, is really huge. And it's something that actually people are not talking about usually, uh, because when someone says the word inequality, a lot of people automatically assume that it's an equality between men and women. However, um, there are also different kinds of inequality and this inequality is very significant because until we somehow decrease the gap between these two parts of societies, we will never actually achieve a diff a, some substantial change in our living. Uh, the last point is kind of obvious, and it's actually something that we are talking about very often. Inequalities also exhibit themselves in the form of basic facilities for a few and surplus for the rest. Um, this is, for example, very visible if you take the number of hospitals in the United States of America and the number of hospitals in Liberia. In Liberia, in the whole country of approximately 10 million people, there's only one big hospital, which is taking patients from all around the country. However, in the United States, I would be lying about the correct number, but there are thousands. And even, even basically in one city, for example, let's take Boston, there are more than 10 to 15 different hospitals all over the city. However, Liberia is one of the poorest country in the world, has only one hospital, which is taking patients from all around the country. So, yes, the reason. There are a lot of reasons, of course, uh, why the inequality gap is actually increasing and why we cannot actually achieve a lot of things. But uh, one reason which is especially relevant to me and which is especially relevant to Impact Summit is the degree in which organi organization of various large event works. So on the left, you can see an impact summit event in very rural country, uh, county in Liberia. It's basically in a city called Sanikali city. Uh, there, there's no decent work uh, road leading towards this city. And this city basically, 90% of the city is without stable electricity. And basically, it's one of the poorest parts of Liberia. However, as you can see, we were, we were able to manage a leadership event there in a local school, which was essentially one of the first leadership events organized there uh, in the history for high school students. On the right, you can see an amazing conference called Time in Qatar. It's one of the largest conferences in the world. It's absolutely uh, incredible. Uh, I have to admit that I've participated in that conference twice myself, and it's absolutely something um, 
you cannot even imagine about like the level of conference is so high the um the level of the facility even is so high and so on and of course as you can see this kind of event in qatar attracted more than 1500 people and the event in liberia attracted 25 students even though we tried to basically distribute all these different flyers and encourage people to attend. The problem is that a lot of these large conferences are actually always organized in these more economically developed countries. So they're usually organized in countries like Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, which has a lot of conferences, Qatar, as we can see, or United States of America. But when was the last time that actually this large leadership event with all these different uh, speakers, all these different guests was organized somewhere in West Africa, somewhere in Liberia, Sierra Leone? Uh, unfortunately, it has never happened. And they have the facilities. Um, of course, it's not so modern like you can see in the picture on the right. But when I was there last year and this year, I saw amazing facilities which could host more than 1,000 people. And really with some sponsorship, with some funding, it could work. However, these organizations are unfortunately never even realized, uh, like suggesting that such conference could take place in less economically developed country. Of course, there are a lot of difficulties. I'm fully aware of that. Um, there are a lot of uh, security risks in these countries. Uh, of course, these countries does not have such stable political situation. And of course, they do not, they are not ready for such event. But uh, if countries like Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia are ready, I think that with little help, little support, and of course, with a little help of the government, there would be a possibility to do such event in, of course, in countries like Liberia and Sierra Leone as well. So according to Impact Summit, and of course, according to myself, one of the reasons why the inequality and opportunity is so huge in, these, in between these countries is because there are simply no opportunities in a lot of less economically developed countries nowadays, or at least before the coronavirus. Uh, maybe and hopefully things will change, but uh, we will have to see about that. So equality and opportunity, unfortunately, does not exist. And I would like to prove it in a, uh, in a bit. So I would like to... Uh, I would like to have a little help from you. So a lot of people can see the chat. So I would like to ask everyone, uh, please do not, uh, please do not write anything into the chat right now. I'm going to send you a link, which is going to ask you a very simple five questions. And I would like everyone, if it would be possible to open that link and try to fill the questions. So try to fill quickly the questions that are under that link. Uh, I hope it's in the chat. So just open the chat section. Uh, I send there a link. So just open the link and ans answer the five easy questions that are there. All of the questions are just yes and no. So the first question is, have you ever been abroad? Yes, no. Have you ever visited a different country? If yes, just simply tick yes. If no, simply tick no. The second question is, have you ever participated in an exchange program? So what does that mean? That means if you were part of a school that went to a different country and basically spent a week there, you experienced uh, what is it like to study in that country, and then the students from that country uh, came to you and came to you and uh, spent a week there. 
The third question is, have you ever been to a less economically developed country? For example, have you visited a country like Ghana or Mali or Sudan or something like this? A country that you think is less economically developed. And the last two questions are very similar. Have you ever participated in a conference in a more economically developed country? Or have you ever participated in a conference in a less economically developed country? So we already got 46 responses. So let's just try to, everyone just try to open the link and let's see. And, I, and then we will analyze the, uh, then I will analyze the answers and we will see the average of the response. So please uh, don't post anything into the chat. I am gonna post the link one more time if you didn't see it. And we have 87 responses. And le let's try to hit at least 100, so 88. Let's try to get some more answers. There are 110 uh, of you in this uh, chat room. So let's try to, there are 93, so last a bit, of, last number of people, 94. So let's take one more minute and then we will look at the answers together. So I will share my screen with you. So as you can see the, uh, so as you can see the answers with me. Okay. So I hope that all of you can see the answer. So we got 95 answers, which is very good. So have you ever been abroad? 80% of the answers answered yes, and 20% answered no, which still means there are a lot of people which have never been to a different country. The second question is a bit more significant. Have you ever participated in an exchange program? So something that is very, uh, of course, which is offered very uh, almost on yearly basis in all of the schools in Europe or United States. 74% uh, of people answered no, and 26% of people answered yes. So as we can see, there's really a huge difference and majority of the people answer, basically three fourths of the people answered no. The next question is, have you ever been to a less economically developed country? So this one is a little bit stable. So 52% of people answered yes, and 48% answered no. So as we can see, almost half of the attendees of today's session uh, have never been to a less economically developed country. Have you ever participated in a conference in a more economically developed country? So this one is also a little bit stable too. So 56% answered yes and 43% answered no. So something uh, which is almost obvious for every high school and university student is apparently not obvious for 40 almost 44% of people in this room, and they have never attended a conference in a more economically developed country. And the last one is, um, there's the biggest difference. Have you ever participated in a conference in a less economically developed country? So as you can see, and 77% answered that no, they have never participated in a conference in a less economically developed country and 23% answered yes, that they have attended a conference in a less economically developed country. So as we can see, really the majority of people have never attended a conference there. Uh, I would just like to ask you, please do not make any drawings into the presentation because it really disturbs the flow of the presentation for others. Thank you very much. So we saw the answers and we saw that equality is not there because if it would be equal all of these would be either 100 percent or it would be around 80 85 but as we can see they're not so i'm going to return to the presentation uh 
I would once again like to ask the person who drew there the A, could you please erase it? Because it's really very disturbing for everyone. And unfortunately, I cannot do it myself because only the person who did it can. So let's move. We can change this inequality. As we can see, it's possible to organize conferences in less economically developed country. Uh, of course, now I'm talking about Impact Summit because I work with Impact Summit, but there are so many different countries. MU and Impact organizes really amazing events in Nigeria from what I've heard. A lot of different organizations started last year and this year organizing leadership programs in these LEDC countries. And that is exactly how we decrease the inequality gap. If we offer same opportunities in more economically developed countries and in less economically developed countries, you will see that it will definitely uh, lower the unemployment rate it will definitely increase the gross domestic product in all of these countries. It will increase education uh, availability for a lot of students. It will basically affect all these different sustainable development goals. So, uh, of course, there are parts that people from more economically developed countries have to do and people from less economically developed countries have to do. So let's now look at the activities that ideally the, the people, societies, countries, and the more economically developed con uh, countries should do. I, will, I took like four examples, but there are millions of them. Let's say football matches. I, I am quite sure that a lot of you in this chat play football, or at least you have your favorite football team or even like sports event. It's, it doesn't necessarily have to be a football uh, related issue. But you see all these broadcasts, uh, let's say in Liberia, in Sierra Leone where I've been. So there are restaurants, there are places and people watch football there. So I was just, uh, for example, when I went to get some lunch with my team and they were football broadcasting. And that football broadcasting was a match between Chelsea and Manchester United, which is of course amazing, but why don't actually people in Liberia promote their own football teams, their own, own football uh, confederation? And when I asked them these questions in that restaurant, they said that uh, no one is interested in local football matches because they're not big, they're not attended by a lot of people, and that basically they have never seen a match of their national football team, but they have much more often seen a match of the English national football team. If we would take one large football match to less economically developed country, let's say, uh, I'm not gonna say always Liberia, but let's say, now I don't want to of course offend any country, but let's say Oman, Oman, which is not the poorest country in the world, but definitely it could be taken as a less economically developed countries. Why uh, some finale of some cup or championship does not take place in Oman? The last, finale of a championship I was watching was from Saudi Arabia, one of the richest countries, or in England, or in Portugal. And I've basically never seen a, a finale or a broadcast from some less economically developed countries. And it would have such a huge impact, because if we would take all these teams, all these sponsors, all these organizations to that country, you would see the difference that suddenly a lot of people would start uh, being interested in local fo football matches and supporting lo uh, local matches because they would want their teams to be in these, these kind of cups. But let's not just talk about sports. Let's talk more about the leadership events. Let's organize biggest events in poorest countries. Why don't we take one event, for example, the time in Qatar event? Why don't we take it 
to a country, like, let's say, we don't have to start from the poorest country, but let's say Ethiopia. Why don't we take a, such a large event to Ethiopia, which is a country of tourism? It has fairly uh, well-built infrastructure. Uh, it, there's one of the headquarters of the African Union, and it is very accessible for a lot, a lot of these international people. However, I've never even been invited, and I have never uh, even heard about a really large event, like 1,500 people taking place there. And even if it sounds like something pathetic, like, okay, we're gonna organize this, everything will go well, and then things will finish. But that's not true. If we organize this large event in this country, it's gonna start a chain reaction. Suddenly more people will be interested in let's say Molo United Nations conferences. Suddenly a lot of sponsors will come into the country because they will see that it is possible to organize this event in that country. Suddenly more tourists, more visitors will come because uh, they will see, okay, my friend attended a conference there. He was extremely thrilled about everything that took place there. I want to go there as well. So once again, all of these 17 sustainable de development goals will be once again nearer to reach because these countries are the ones that lag the most behind the 2030 agenda. My third point is, let's offer to people opportunity to study abroad in, on larger scale. There are, of course, a lot of opportunities for people to study abroad. Um, once again, when I was in Ghana, uh, I met with a lot of students that, let's say, went to Europe let's say I went to uh, America. But as you could see in the questionnaire which we did, almost 70% of people have never participated in an exchange program. And unfortunately, the reason for this usually is that the people don't know that these exchange programs exist. They exist, but people in rural communities don't know about them. In let's Sierra Leone, Liberia, almost no one has smartphones. Unfortunately, these exchange programs do not uh, adjust to the situation in these LEDC countries. And because of that, uh, no, only students that study at the best university in the country know about it. But there are a lot of other qualified people that would immensely benefit from these study programs that just cannot go because they don't know about it. So what I definitely suggest is we cannot just share information about them online, but of course we also have to do some in-place promotion or some printed materials, which actually can reach people. And the last one is let's distribute laptops the way we distribute them in more economically developed countries. There are so many schools, even in Czech Republic, where every single student gets a new laptop from the school, just because the school has a large budget. Uh, schools in these countries like West Africa, basically inter Africa, they, or even Asia, South America, students just don't get laptops. And it really steals from them so many opportunities, so many different resources. Even they cannot like study properly for their exams. And that's the reason why, for example, in SAT tests, which are mandatory for high school students, in United Nations, and a lot of people from these different countries take them as well. People from USA and more economically developed countries always score much higher because we have such a large diversity of resources we can study from, and they don't have that. So I, would, I know that it's gonna take time, but I will at least slowly start working on the distribution of technology in these LEDC countries, because essentially that's the future. Now, uh, this is a little bit more, more details, uh, more detailed what I would personally suggest that we could do. Uh, I will just quickly skim through it. So school programs. 
we should create a database uh, in Africa connecting schools together. There are so many different databases in USA, Europe, Asia, where schools can get in touch together and can, can come up with these study abroad programs, these collaborations. But in Africa, nothing like this exists. In the whole continent, which is ba which has basically the quarter or even more of population on this planet, they have zero uh, idea what school in different countries do, what kind of program they follow, and if there is any exchange program available. So I would definitely start with universities, and then I would uh, slowly but surely uh, spread it to high schools and even elementary schools. Uh, we can start from the local point and moving it to the international ones. Let's say Liberia has 15 different counties. Uh, the students from these different countries, uh, counties, they don't know each other. A lot of students have never been in these different counties. So what if actually we would create a collaboration between a school from one county and school from a different county? We would send students there for a week. They would learn about their culture about what kind of program they follow. And then the students would come to their county and do the same. And you would see uh, the degree of improvement in the local understanding of culture and of geography of their own country. Uh, cultural programs between schools in Africa, Asia, Europe, and Americas, uh, that's something what I would personally love to do. And that's something that Impact Summit will focus on. Every single country has such a great culture, such an interesting culture. And we learn so much from actually seeing the way how different people live. I traveled to all these different county, countries. I traveled to Liberia. I was in Sierra Leone this year. And I learned so much from these people, from their kindness, from the way how they deal with difficult situations. It really helped me in my personal development. And I believe if a lot of people would have this kind of opportunity, they would definitely afterwards become very, um, they, will, they would become great contributors in their society, in their communities. And you would see that it would reflect once again in all these 17 SDGs. Last one is something what we are doing now. And that is uh, incredibly amazing. And that is the creation of online programs with international global participation. That's something very important. And that's something what we should do. Events, so I will just really quickly go through this. Moving just one event from more economically developing country to LEDC will change the lives of twice as much people as it would change the life in the MEDC countries. The facilities are there as I already said, but the correct use for it is not there. We have to let the youth do it. Of course, if someone from United States is gonna to come to Ethiopia, organize everything and do a conference there, it's not gonna be good. We need the local people to organize it and to take the responsibility. And we have to make sure that fake news do not interfere into portrayal of the image of a country. Uh, of course, when I was traveling to Liberia, people told me, they're gonna kill you, they're gonna kidnap you, they're gonna sell you on black market. Nothing that happened. I was there one month, I had amazing time and I totally fell in love with the country. So we have to make sure that fake news do not destroy the image of some countries. Technologies, so as I already said, we have to provide the funds to people living in rural communities. We have to equip them, equip them with the necessary equipment. We have to decentralize big brands. So we have to make sure that brands also have headquarters in these rural areas, in these different cities in the country and allow self-management. Uh, of course, there needs to be some management from the company, but we need the local people to also be in charge of it. But as I said, it's of course not the only the work from more economically developed countries. Uh, people from LEDC countries also have to do their part. The main problem in LEDC countries is that people do not work together. Everybody wants to org have their own NGOs. So 
I cannot even count the number of NGOs that currently exist in Liberia. It's probably more than 10,000. And majority of these NGO has was one, have just one member, and that member is a person who wants to call himself CEO, director, and stuff. I don't want to offend anyone. Every single NGO has its own part in the society and they contribute. But wouldn't it be more efficient if actually turn 100 NGOs into five powerful NGOs with a lot of members, with a lot of expertise, and we would actually like unite and work together. Like an NGO with one member it just cannot do a lot. It's always a group of individuals always creates more impact than an individual. We also have to trust people and secure safe environments. So of course, uh, people from these LEDC countries have to trust people from MEDC countries and they have to secure that nothing's gonna happen. Uh, of course, it's a bit also their responsibility that nothing's gonna happen to the visitors, to the tourists, to the people that want to help their countries. Uh, promote industrialization and welcome new changes and show to the world the new image of your country. People, I understand that a lot of countries don't want to accept it, but the world is moving. Mm, technology is in charge. And if we will not adjust, we will always be lacking. Let's say, look at Rwanda. Rwanda was such a poor and such a not developed country just a couple of years ago. It has developed so much that it's one of the most developed African countries right now because they accepted the changes, they accepted international help, um, they worked on themselves, and they really built themselves into something amazing. And it was just something that all of these different countries could, should follow. So the last thing what I want to say, uh, we can then dismiss inequality and opportunity, but as I said, only if we work together. If we don't work together, change is never gonna happen and we will never achieve what we want to achieve. So thank you very much for your uh, for listening to me for listening to my presentation and if someone has some questions i'm not sure how much time left we have but i would be more than happy to answer all questions yes albert, we have about hold on sorry albert we have about two or three minutes so i'm going to hand over to the admin to pick two or three questions for you wonderful wonderful thank you yes um we'll be choosing two questions from your wonderful speech um, the first question is from Ma Mahmoud. Mm -hmm. Mahmoud, you may add, ask your question. Um, okay, then then we'll change to um, the next really good question, which is from Alm B from Germany. Uh, sorry, my question was, how are laptops meant to be implemented if many schools don't even have access to regular textbooks and LEDCs? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your question. Uh, of course, uh, that's something that has to be addressed as well. But let's say I'm going to take an example of Rwanda. Uh, there are a lot of schools which started actually, um, they implemented Wi-Fi in their schools. They actually invested a lot of into the uh, into the schools and into the educational system, and I'm not laptops were just an example. Of course, textbooks are very important, but currently a lot of information is online and it's available online. So if we expose all these students to this kind of information, uh, mm -hmm. I believe that it's going to be very beneficial. Of course, it's a long-term program. It's a long-term goal to achieve but definitely technology is here. We cannot ignore it and we have to start adjusting to it. Thank you for your amazing answer. Um, the next question goes to Julia N from the UN UAE. Julia, are you Hi. there? You. Okay, you may um, ask your question. Sure, um, do you believe that the first step rather than implementing um, 
large events would be to better the education system, um, the local education system within the countries? Uh, of course, this is a very good question. Uh, so definitely, like, of course, priority in all these countries should be to make sure that education is available for everyone and to make sure that every single child can at least achieve basic education, such as reading, writing, mathematics, and so on. However, what I also believe, um, actually, what I experience from myself, a lot of parents in LEDC countries do not want to send children to school. They have the possibility, but they don't want to because they want their children to work and to, er, to increase the income of the family. But I believe if we organize these large events in these countries, we expose the entire country to the leadership impact that the event is gonna cause, a lot of parents are gonna change their mind and they will actually see that, um, that actually education uh, is good for their child. And in the long, long term, it's gonna be much more beneficial for the family. Okay, thank you, Albert. I'm afraid our time has come to an end and we're going to have to move on to the next session. So I'd like to thank you for your presentation. Um, I would like to thank all the participants for joining us and for your comments and questions in the chat. Uh, thank you very much, Nicola. Uh, it has been uh, honor for me to present here and uh, I just want to make sure of course I agree with everyone there are these all SDGs which we have to achieve however my presentation was about opportunity and how we can expose all these students in opportunity of course I agree there are a lot of different issues which we have to address like world hunger but I would need much more time for that to address all the SDGs. So I hope that this presentation has motivated people and definitely motivated to pay a lot of attention and during all these workshops, which are all together addressing all the goals, all the SDGs that are important. So thank you very much. And it's been an honor for me to be here as a guest.